chapter four of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter four the thirteenth amendment we have enumerated with some detail the series of radical anti-slavery measures enacted at the second session of the thirty-seventh congress which ended july seventeenth eighteen sixty two the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia the prohibition of slavery in the national territories the practical repeal of the fugitive slave law and the sweeping measures of confiscation which in different forms decreed forfeiture of slave property for the crimes of treason and rebellion when this wholesale legislation was supplemented by the president's preliminary emancipation proclamation of september twenty two eighteen sixty two and his final edict of freedom of january one eighteen sixty three the institution had clearly received its coup de grace in all except the loyal border states consequently the third session of the thirty seventh congress ending march fourth eighteen sixty three occupied itself with this phase of the slavery question only to the extent of an effort to put into operation the president's plan of compensated abolishment that effort took practical shape in a bill to give the state of missouri fifteen millions on condition that she would emancipate her slaves but the proposition failed largely through the opposition of a few conservative members from missouri and the session adjourned without having by its legislation advanced the destruction of slavery when congress met again in december eighteen sixty three and organized by the election of schuyler colfax of indiana as speaker the whole situation had undergone further change the union arms had been triumphant gettysburg had been won and vicksburg had capitulated lincoln's edict of freedom had become an accepted fact fifty regiments of negro soldiers carried bayonets in the union armies vallandigham had been beaten for governor in ohio by a hundred thousand majority the draft had been successfully enforced in every district of every loyal state in the union under these brightening prospects military and political the more progressive spirits in congress took up anew the suspended battle with slavery which the institution had itself invited by its unprovoked assault on the life of the government the president's reference to the subject in his annual message was very brief the movements by state action for emancipation in several of the states not included in the emancipation proclamation are matters of profound gratulation and while i do not repeat in detail what i have heretofore so earnestly urged upon this subject my general views and feelings remain unchanged and i trust that congress will omit no fair opportunity of aiding these important steps to a great consummation his language had reference to maryland where during the autumn of eighteen sixty three the question of emancipation had been actively discussed by political parties and where at the election of november fourth eighteen sixty three a legislature had been chosen containing a considerable majority pledged to emancipation more especially did it refer to missouri where notwithstanding the failure of the fifteen million compensation bill at the previous session a state convention had actually passed an ordinance of emancipation though with such limitations as rendered it unacceptable to the more advanced public opinion of the state prudence was the very essence of mr lincoln's statesmanship and he doubtless felt it was not safe for the executive to venture farther at that time we are like whalers he said to governor morgan one day who have been long on a chase we have at last got the harpoon into the monster but we must now look how we steer or with one flop of his tail he will send us all into eternity senators and members of the house especially those representing anti-slavery states or districts did not need to be so circumspect it was doubtless with this consciousness that j m ashley 
a republican representative from ohio and james f wilson a republican representative from iowa on the fourteenth of december eighteen sixty three that being the earliest opportunity after the house was organized introduced the former a bill and the latter a joint resolution to propose to the several states an amendment of the constitution prohibiting slavery throughout the united states both the propositions were referred to the committee on the judiciary of which mr wilson was chairman but before he made any report on the subject it had been brought before the senate where its discussion attracted marked public attention senator john b henderson who with rare courage and skill had as a progressive conservative made himself one of the leading champions of missouri emancipation on the eleventh of january eighteen sixty four introduced into the senate a joint resolution proposing an amendment to the constitution that slavery shall not exist in the united states it is not probable that either he or the senate saw any near hope of success in such a measure the resolution went to the committee on the judiciary apparently without being treated as a matter of pressing importance nearly a month had elapsed when mr sumner also introduced a joint resolution proposing an amendment that everywhere within the limits of the united states and of each state or territory thereof all persons are equal before the law so that no person can hold another as a slave he asked its reference to the select committee on slavery of which he was chairman but several senators argued that such an amendment properly belonged to the committee on the judiciary and in this reference mr sumner finally acquiesced it is possible that this slight and courteously worded rivalry between the two committees induced earlier action than would otherwise have happened for two days later lyman trumbull chairman of the judiciary committee reported back a substitute in the following language differing from the phraseology of both mr sumner and mr henderson article thirteen section one neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the united states or any place subject to their jurisdiction section two congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation even after the committee on the judiciary by this report had adopted the measure it was evidently thought to be merely in an experimental stage for more than six weeks elapsed before the senate again took it up for action on the twenty eighth of march however mr trumbull formally opened debate upon it in an elaborate speech the discussion was continued from time to time until the eighth of april as the republicans had almost unanimous control of the senate their speeches though able and eloquent seemed perfunctory and devoted to a foregone conclusion those which attracted most attention were the arguments of reverdy johnson of maryland and mr henderson of missouri senators representing slave states advocating the amendment senator sumner whose pride of erudition amounted almost to vanity pleaded earnestly for his phrase all persons are equal before the law copied from the constitution of revolutionary france but jacob m howard of michigan one of the soundest lawyers and clearest thinkers of the senate pointed out the inapplicability of the words and declared it safer to follow the ordinance of seventeen eighty seven with its historical associations and its well adjudicated meaning there was of course from the first no doubt whatever that the senate would pass the constitutional amendment the political classification of that body being thirty-six republicans five conditional unionists and nine democrats not only was the whole republican strength thirty-six votes cast in its favor but two democrats reverdy johnson of maryland and james w nesmith of oregon with a political wisdom far in advance of their party also voted for it giving more than the two-thirds required by the constitution when however the joint resolution went to the house of representatives there was such a formidable party strength arrayed against it as to foreshadow its failure the party classification of the house stood one hundred and two republicans seventy-five democrats and nine from the border states leaving but little chance of obtaining the required two-thirds vote in favor of the measure 
nevertheless there was sufficient republican strength to secure its discussion and when it came up on the thirty first of may the first vote showed seventy six to fifty five against rejecting the joint resolution we may infer that the conviction of the present hopelessness of the measure greatly shortened the debate upon it the question occupied the house only on three different days the thirty first of may when it was taken up and the fourteenth and fifteenth of june the speeches in opposition all came from democrats the speeches in its favor all came from republicans except one from its adoption the former predicted the direst evils to the constitution and the republic the latter the most beneficial results in the restoration of the country to peace and the fulfilment of the high destiny intended for it by its founders upon the final question of its passage the vote stood yeas ninety three nays sixty five absent or not voting twenty three of those voting in favor of the resolution eighty seven were republicans and four were democrats those voting against it were all democrats the resolution not having secured a two-thirds vote was thus lost seeing which mr ashley republican who had the measure in charge changed his vote so that he might if occasion arose move its reconsideration the ever vigilant public opinion of the loyal states intensified by the burdens and anxieties of the war took up this far-reaching question of abolishing slavery by constitutional amendment with an interest fully as deep as that manifested by congress before the joint resolution had failed in the house of representatives the issue was already transferred to discussion and prospective decision in a new forum when on the seventh of june eighteen sixty four the national republican convention met in baltimore the two most vital thoughts which animated its members were the renomination of mr lincoln and the success of the constitutional amendment the first was recognized as a popular decision needing only the formality of an announcement by the convention and the full emphasis of speech and resolution was therefore centred on the latter as the dominant and aggressive reform upon which the party would stake its political fortunes in the coming campaign it is not among the least of the evidences of president lincoln's political sagacity and political courage that it was he himself who supplied the spark that fired this train of popular action the editor of the new york independent who attended the convention and who with others visited mr lincoln immediately after the nomination printed the following in his paper of june sixteenth eighteen sixty four when one of us mentioned the great enthusiasm at the convention after senator e d morgan's proposition to amend the constitution abolishing slavery mr lincoln instantly said it was i who suggested to mr morgan that he should put that idea into his opening speech the declaration of morgan who was chairman of the national republican committee and as such called the convention to order immediately found an echo in the speech of the temporary chairman the rev dr robert j breckinridge the endorsement of the principle by the eminent kentucky divine not on the ground of party but on the high philosophy of true universal government and of genuine christian religion gave the announcement an interest and significance accorded to few planks in party platforms the permanent chairman william dennison reaffirmed the doctrine of morgan and breckinridge and the thunderous applause of the whole convention greeted the formal proclamation of the new dogma of political faith in the third resolution of the platform resolved that as slavery was the cause and now constitutes the strength of this rebellion and as it must be always and everywhere hostile to the principles of republican government justice and the national safety demand its utter and complete extirpation from the soil of the republic and that while we uphold and maintain the acts and proclamations by which the government in its own defence has aimed a death blow at this gigantic evil we are in favour furthermore of such an amendment to the constitution to be made by the people in conformity with its provisions as shall terminate and for ever prohibit the existence of slavery within the limits or the jurisdiction of the united states 
we have related elsewhere how upon this and the other declarations of the platform the republican party went to battle and gained an overwhelming victory a popular majority of four a hundred and eleven thousand two hundred and eighty one an electoral majority of one hundred and ninety one and a house of representatives of a hundred and thirty eight unionists to thirty five democrats in view of this result the president was able to take up the question with confidence among his official recommendations and in the annual message which he transmitted to congress on the sixth of december eighteen sixty four he urged upon the members whose terms were about to expire the propriety of at once carrying into effect the clearly expressed popular will said he at the last session of congress a proposed amendment of the constitution abolishing slavery throughout the united states passed the senate but failed for lack of the requisite two-thirds vote in the house of representatives although the present is the same congress and nearly the same members and without questioning the wisdom or patriotism of those who stood in opposition i venture to recommend the reconsideration and passage of the measure at the present session of course the abstract question is not changed but an intervening election shows almost certainly that the next congress will pass the measure if this does not hence there is only a question of time as to when the proposed amendment will go to the states for their action and as it is to so go at all events may we not agree that the sooner the better it is not claimed that the election has imposed a duty on members to change their views or their votes any further than as an additional element to be considered their judgment may be affected by it it is the voice of the people now for the first time heard upon the question in a great national crisis like ours unanimity of action among those seeking a common end is very desirable almost indispensable and yet no approach to such unanimity is attainable unless some deference shall be paid to the will of the majority simply because it is the will of the majority in this case the common end is the maintenance of the union and among the means to secure that end such will through the election is most clearly declared in favor of such constitutional amendment on the fifteenth of december mr ashley gave notice that he would on the sixth of january eighteen sixty five call up the constitutional amendment for reconsideration and accordingly on the day appointed he opened the new debate upon it in an earnest speech general discussion followed from time to time occupying perhaps half the days of the month of january as at the previous session the republicans all favored while the democrats mainly opposed it but the important exceptions among the latter showed what immense gains the proposition had made in popular opinion and in congressional willingness to recognize and embody it the logic of events had become more powerful than party creed or strategy for fifteen years the democratic party has stood as sentinel and bulwark to slavery and yet despite its alliance and championship the peculiar institution was being consumed like dry leaves in the fire of war for a whole decade it had been defeated in every great contest of congressional debate and legislation it had withered in popular elections been paralyzed by confiscation laws crushed by executive decrees trampled upon by marching union armies more notable than all the agony of dissolution had come upon it in its final stronghold the constitutions of the slave states local public opinion had throttled it in west virginia in missouri in arkansas in louisiana in maryland and the same spirit of change was upon tennessee and even showing itself in kentucky here was a great revolution of ideas a mighty sweep of sentiment which could not be explained away by the stale charge of sectional fanaticism or by alleging technical irregularities of political procedure here was a mighty flood of public opinion overleaping old barriers and rushing into new channels the democratic party did not and could not shut its eyes to the accomplished facts in my judgment said william s holman of indiana the fate of slavery is sealed it dies by the rebellious hand of its votaries untouched by the law its fate is determined by the war by the measures of the war by the results of the war these sir must determine it even if the constitution were amended 
he opposed the amendment he declared simply because it was unnecessary though few other democrats were so frank all their speeches were weighed down by the same consciousness of a losing fight a hopeless cause the democratic leader of the house and lately defeated democratic candidate for vice-president george h pendleton opposed the amendment as he had done at the previous session by asserting that three-fourths of the states did not possess constitutional power to pass it this being if the paradox be excused at the same time the weakest and the strongest argument weakest because the constitution in terms contradicted the assertion strongest because under the circumstances nothing less than unconstitutionality could justify opposition but while the democrats as a party thus persisted in a false attitude more progressive members had the courage to take independent and wiser action not only did the four democrats moses f odell and john a griswold of new york joseph bailey of pennsylvania and ezra wheeler of wisconsin who supported the amendment at the first session again record their votes in its favor but they were now joined by thirteen others of their party associates namely augustus c baldwin of michigan alexander h coffroth and archibald mcallister of pennsylvania james e english of connecticut john ganson anson herrick homer a nelson william radford and john b steele of new york wells a hutchins of ohio austin a king and james s rollins of missouri and george h yeaman of kentucky and by their help the favorable two-thirds vote was secured but special credit for the result must not be accorded to these alone even more than of northern democrats must be recognized the courage and progressive liberality of members from the border slave states one from delaware four from maryland three from west virginia four from kentucky and seven from missouri whose speeches and votes aided the consummation of the great act and finally something is due to those democrats eight in number who were absent without pairs and thus perhaps not altogether by accident reduce somewhat the two-thirds vote necessary to the passage of the joint resolution mingled with these influences of a public and moral nature it is not unlikely that others of more selfish interest operating both for and against the amendment were not entirely wanting one who was a member of the house writes the success of the measure had been considered very doubtful and depended upon certain negotiations the result of which was not fully assured and the particulars of which never reached the public so also one of the president's secretaries wrote on the eighteenth of january i went to the president this afternoon at the request of mr ashley on a matter connecting itself with the pending amendment of the constitution the camden and amboy railroad interest promised mr ashley that if he would help postpone the raritan railroad bill over this session they would in return make the new jersey democrats help about the amendment either by their votes or absence sumner being the senate champion of the raritan bill ashley went to him to ask him to drop it for this session sumner however showed reluctance to adopt mr ashley's suggestion saying that he hoped the amendment would pass anyhow etc ashley thought he discerned in sumner's manner two reasons one that if the present senate resolution were not adopted by the house the senate would send them another in which they would most likely adopt sumner's own phraseology and thereby gratify his ambition and two that sumner thinks the defeat of the camden and amboy monopoly would establish a principle by legislative enactment which would effectually crush out the last lingering relics of the state's rights dogma ashley therefore desired the president to send for sumner and urge him to be practical and secure the passage of the amendment in the manner suggested by mr ashley i stated these points to the president who replied at once i can do nothing with mr sumner in these matters while mr sumner is very cordial with me he is making his history in an issue with me on this very point he hopes to succeed in beating the president so as to change this government from its original form and make it a strong centralized power then calling mr ashley into the room the president said to him i think i understand mr sumner and i think he would be all the more resolute in his persistence on the points which mr nicolay has mentioned to me if he supposed i were at all watching his course on this matter the issue was decided in the afternoon of the thirty first of january eighteen sixty five 
the scene was one of unusual interest the galleries were filled to overflowing the members watched the proceedings with unconcealed solicitude up to noon said a contemporaneous formal report the pro-slavery party are said to have been confident of defeating the amendment and after that time had passed one of the most earnest advocates of the measure said t is the toss of a copper there were the usual pleas for postponement and for permission to offer amendments or substitutes but at four o'clock the house came to a final vote and the roll-call showed yeas one hundred and nineteen nays fifty six not voting eight scattering murmurs of applause had followed the announcement of affirmative votes from several of the democratic members this was renewed when by direction of the speaker the clerk called his name and he voted aye but when the speaker finally announced the constitutional majority of two-thirds having voted in the affirmative the joint resolution is passed the announcement so continues the official report printed in the globe was received by the house and by the spectators with an outburst of enthusiasm the members on the republican side of the house instantly sprung to their feet and regardless of parliamentary rules applauded with cheers and clapping of hands the example is followed by the male spectators in the galleries which were crowded to excess who waved their hats and cheered loud and long while the ladies hundreds of whom were present rose in their seats and waved their handkerchiefs participating in and adding to the general excitement and intense interest of the scene this lasted for several minutes in honour of this immortal and sublime event cried eben c ingersoll of illinois i move that the house do now adjourn and against the objection of a maryland democrat the motion was carried by a yea and nay vote a salute of one hundred guns soon made the occasion the subject of comment and congratulation throughout the city on the following night a considerable procession marched with music to the executive mansion to carry popular greetings to the president in response to their calls mr lincoln appeared at a window and made a brief speech of which only an abstract report was preserved but which is nevertheless important as showing the searching analysis of cause and effect which this question had undergone in his mind the deep interest he felt in and the far-reaching consequences he attached to the measure and its success he supposed the passage through congress of the constitutional amendment for the abolishment of slavery throughout the united states was the occasion to which he was indebted for the honor of this call the occasion was one of congratulation to the country and to the whole world but there is a task yet before us to go forward and have consummated by the votes of the states that which congress has so nobly begun yesterday he had the honor to inform those present that illinois had already to-day done the work maryland was about half through but he felt proud that illinois was a little ahead he thought this measure was a very fitting if not an indispensable adjunct to the winding up of the great difficulty he wished the reunion of all the states perfected and so effected as to remove all causes of disturbance in the future and to attain this end it was necessary that the original disturbing cause should if possible be rooted out he thought all would bear him witness that he had never shrunk from doing all that he could do to eradicate slavery by issuing an emancipation proclamation but that proclamation falls far short of what the amendment will be when fully consummated a question might be raised whether the proclamation was legally valid it might be urged that it only aided those that came into our lines and that it was inoperative as to those who did not give themselves up or that it would have no effect upon the children of slaves born hereafter in fact it would be urged that it did not meet the evil but this amendment is a king's cure-all for all the evils it winds the whole thing up he would repeat that it was the fitting if not the indispensable adjunct to the consummation of the great game we are playing he could not but congratulate all present himself the country and the whole world upon this great moral victory widely divergent views were expressed by able constitutional lawyers in both branches of congress as to what in the anomalous condition of the country would constitute a valid ratification of the thirteenth amendment 
some contending that ratification by three-fourths of the loyal states would be sufficient others that three-fourths of all the states whether loyal or insurrectionary would be necessary we have seen that mr lincoln in his speech on louisiana reconstruction while expressing no opinion against the first proposition nevertheless declared with great argumentative force that the latter would be unquestioned and unquestionable and this view appears to have governed the action of his successor as mr lincoln mentioned with just pride in his address illinois was the first state to ratify the amendment taking her action on february one the day after the joint resolution was passed by the house of representatives and ratification by other states continued in the following order rhode island february two eighteen sixty five michigan february two eighteen sixty five maryland february three eighteen sixty five new york february three eighteen sixty five west virginia february three eighteen sixty five maine february seven eighteen sixty five kansas february seven eighteen sixty five massachusetts february eight eighteen sixty five pennsylvania february eight eighteen sixty five virginia february nine eighteen sixty five ohio february tenth eighteen sixty five missouri february tenth eighteen sixty five indiana february sixteenth eighteen sixty five nevada february sixteenth eighteen sixty five louisiana february seventeenth eighteen sixty five minnesota february twenty three eighteen sixty five wisconsin march one eighteen sixty five vermont march ninth eighteen sixty five tennessee april seventh eighteen sixty five arkansas april twenty eighteen sixty five connecticut may five eighteen sixty five new hampshire july one eighteen sixty five south carolina november thirteen eighteen sixty five alabama december two eighteen sixty five north carolina december four eighteen sixty five georgia december nine eighteen sixty five oregon december eleven eighteen sixty five california december twenty eighteen sixty five florida december twenty eighth eighteen sixty five new jersey january twenty three eighteen sixty six iowa january twenty four eighteen sixty six texas february eighteen eighteen seventy without waiting for the ratification by the last six of these states mr seward who remained as secretary of state in the cabinet of president johnson made official proclamation on december eighteen eighteen sixty five that the legislatures of twenty-seven states constituting three-fourths of the thirty-six states of the union had ratified the amendment and that it had become valid as a part of the constitution of the united states it needs to be noted that four of the states constituting this number of twenty-seven were virginia louisiana tennessee and arkansas whose reconstruction had been effected under the direction and by the authority of president lincoln the profound political transformation which the american republic had undergone can perhaps best be measured by contrasting for an instant the two constitutional amendments which congress made it the duty of the lincoln administration to submit officially to the several states the first was that offered by thomas corwin chairman of the committee of thirty three in february eighteen sixty one and passed by the house of representatives yeas one hundred and thirty three nays sixty five and by the senate yeas twenty four nays twelve it was signed by president buchanan as one of his last official acts and accepted and endorsed by lincoln in his inaugural address the language of that amendment was no amendment shall be made to the constitution which will authorize or give to congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state between lincoln's inauguration and the outbreak of war the department of state under seward transmitted this amendment of eighteen sixty one to the several states for their action and had the south shown a willingness to desist from secession and accept it as a peace offering there is little doubt that the required three-fourths of the states would have made it a part of the constitution but the south refused to halt in her rebellion and the thunder of beauregard's guns against fort sumter drove away all further thought 
or possibility of such a ratification and within four years congress framed and the same lincoln administration sent forth the amendment of eighteen sixty five sweeping out of existence by one sentence the institution to which it had in its first proposal offered a virtual claim to perpetual recognition and tolerance the new birth of freedom which lincoln invoked for the nation in his gettysburg address was accomplished end of chapter four chapter five of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter five blair's mexican project the triumphant re-election of mr lincoln in november eighteen sixty four greatly simplified the political conditions as well as the military prospects of the country decisive popular majorities had pointedly rebuked the individuals who proclaimed and the party which had resolved that the war was a failure the verdict of the ballot-box not only decided the continuance of a war administration and a war policy but renewed the assurance of a public sentiment to sustain its prosecution when congress convened on the sixth of december and the president transmitted to that body his annual message he included in his comprehensive review of public affairs a temperate but strong and terse statement of this fact and its potent significance inspired by this majestic manifestation of the popular will to preserve the union and maintain the constitution he was able to speak of the future with hope and confidence but with characteristic prudence and good taste he uttered no word of boasting and indulged in no syllable of acrimony on the contrary in terms of fatherly kindness he again offered the rebellious states the generous conditions he had previously tendered them by various acts and declarations and specifically in his amnesty proclamation of december eighth eighteen sixty three the statement of the whole situation with its alternative issues was so admirably compressed into the closing paragraphs of his message as to leave no room for ignorance or misunderstanding the national resources then are unexhausted and as we believe inexhaustible the public purpose to re-establish and maintain the national authority is unchanged and as we believe unchangeable the manner of continuing the effort remains to choose on careful consideration of all the evidence accessible it seems to me that no attempt at negotiation with the insurgent leader could result in any good he would accept nothing short of severance of the union precisely what we will not and cannot give his declarations to this effect are explicit and oft repeated he does not attempt to deceive us he affords us no excuse to deceive ourselves he cannot voluntarily re-accept the union we cannot voluntarily yield it between him and us the issue is distinct simple and inflexible it is an issue which can only be tried by war and decided by victory if we yield we are beaten if the southern people fail him he is beaten either way it would be the victory and defeat following war what is true however of him who heads the insurgent cause is not necessarily true of those who follow although he cannot re-accept the union they can some of them we know already desire peace and reunion the number of such may increase they can at any moment have peace simply by laying down their arms and submitting to the national authority under the constitution after so much the government could not if it would maintain war against them the loyal people would not sustain or allow it if questions should remain we would adjust them by the peaceful means of legislation conference courts and votes operating only in constitutional and lawful channels 
some certain and other possible questions are and would be beyond the executive power to adjust as for instance the admission of members into congress and whatever might require the appropriation of money the executive power itself would be greatly diminished by the cessation of actual war pardons and remissions of forfeitures however would still be within executive control in what spirit and temper this control would be exercised can be fairly judged of by the past a year ago general pardon and amnesty upon specified terms were offered to all except certain designated classes and it was at the same time made known that the accepted classes were still within contemplation of special clemency in presenting the abandonment of armed resistance to the national authority on the part of the insurgents as the only indispensable condition to ending the war on the part of the government i retract nothing heretofore said as to slavery i repeat the declaration made a year ago that while i remain in my present position i shall not attempt to retract or modify the emancipation proclamation nor shall i return to slavery any person who is free by the terms of that proclamation or by any of the acts of congress if the people should by whatever mode or means make it an executive duty to re-enslave such persons another and not i must be their instrument to perform it in stating a single condition of peace i mean simply to say that the war will cease on the part of the government whenever it shall have ceased on the part of those who began it the country was about to enter upon the fifth year of actual war but all the indications were pointing unmistakably to a speedy collapse of the rebellion this foreshadowed disaster to the confederate armies gave rise to another volunteer peace project and negotiation which from the boldness of its animating thought and the official prominence of its actors assumes a special importance the veteran politician francis p blair senior who as a young journalist thirty-five years before had helped president jackson throttle the south carolina nullification who from his long political and personal experience at washington perhaps knew better than almost any one else the individual characters and tempers of southern leaders and who moreover was ambitious to crown his remarkable career with another dazzling chapter of political intrigue conceived that the time had arrived when he might perhaps take up the role of a successful mediator between the north and the south he gave various hints of his desire to president lincoln but received neither encouragement nor opportunity to unfold his plans come to me after savannah falls was lincoln's evasive reply and when on the twenty second of december sherman announced the surrender of that city as a national christmas gift mr blair hastened to put his design into execution three days after christmas the president gave him a simple card bearing the words allow the bearer f p blair senior to pass our lines go south and return december twenty eighth eighteen sixty four a lincoln with this single credential he went to the camp of general grant from which he forwarded by the usual flags of truce the following letters to jefferson davis at richmond headquarters armies of the united states december thirty eighteen sixty four jefferson davis president etc etc my dear sir the loss of some papers of importance title papers which i suppose may have been taken by some persons who had access to my house when general early's army were in possession of my place induces me to ask the privilege of visiting richmond and beg the favor of you to facilitate my inquiries in regard to them your most obedient servant f p blair headquarters armies of the united states december thirty eighteen sixty four jefferson davis president etc etc my dear sir the fact stated in the enclosed note may serve to answer inquiries as to the object of my visit which if allowed by you i would not communicate fully to any one but yourself the main purpose i have in seeing you is to explain the views i entertain in reference to the state of the affairs of our country and to submit to your consideration ideas which in my opinion you may turn to good and possibly bring to practical results 
that may not only repair all the ruin the war has brought upon the nation but contribute to promote the welfare of other nations that have suffered from it in candour i must say to you in advance that i come to you wholly unaccredited except in so far as i may be by having permission to pass our lines and to offer to you my own suggestions suggestions which i have submitted to no one in authority on this side the lines and will not without my conversation with you may lead me to suppose they may lead to something practicable with the hope of such result if allowed i will confidentially unbosom my heart frankly and without reserve you will of course hold in reserve all that is not proper to be said to one coming as i do merely as a private citizen and addressing one clothed with the highest responsibilities unless the great interests now at stake induce you to attribute more importance to my application than it would otherwise command i could not expect that you would invite the intrusion i venture however to submit the matter to your judgment your most obedient servant f p blair mr davis returned a reply with permission to make the visit but by some mischance it did not reach mr blair till after his patience had become exhausted by waiting and he had returned to washington proceeding then to richmond he was received by jefferson davis in a confidential interview on the twelfth of january eighteen sixty five which he thoroughly described in a written report of which we quote the essential portions i introduced the subject to mr davis by giving him an account of the mode in which i obtained leave to go through the lines telling him that the president stopped me when i told him i had kindly relations with mr davis and at the proper time i might do something towards peace and said come to me when savannah falls how oh, after that event he shunned an interview with me until i perceived he did not wish to hear me but desired i should go without explanation of my object i then told mr davis that i wanted to know if he thought fit to communicate it whether he had any commitments with european powers which would control his conduct in making arrangements with the government of the united states he said in the most decisive manner that there were none that he had no commitments and expressed himself with some vehemence that he was absolutely free and would die a free man in all respects this is pretty much his language it was his sentiment and manner certainly i told him that that was an all-important point for if it were otherwise i would not have another word to say i then prefaced the reading of the paper which i had intended to embody in a letter to him or present in some form if i could not reach him or if i were prevented from seeing him personally by saying that it was somewhat after the manner of an editorial and was not of a diplomatic character he replied that he gave me his full confidence knew that i was an earnest man and believed i was an honest man and said he reciprocated the attachment which i had expressed for him and his family that he was under great obligations to my family for kindnesses rendered to his that he would never forget them and that even when dying they would be remembered in his prayers i then read the paper to him suggestions submitted to jefferson davis president etc etc the amnesty proclamation of president lincoln in connection with his last message to congress referring to the termination of the rebellion presents a basis on which i think permanent peace and union between the warring sections of our country may be re-established the amnesty offered would doubtless be enlarged to secure these objects and made to embrace all who sincerely desired to renew and confirm their allegiance to the government of the united states by the extinction of the institution which originated the war against the national republic slavery no longer remains an insurmountable obstruction to pacification you propose to use the slaves in some mode to conquer a peace for the south if this race be employed to secure the independence of the southern states by risking their lives in the service the achievement is certainly to be crowned with their deliverance from bondage slavery the cause of all our woes is admitted now on all sides to be doomed as an institution all the world condemns it this expiation made what remains to distract our country 
it now seems a free will offering on the part of the south as essential to its own safety being made nothing but military force can keep the north and south asunder we see them coming together again after momentary rupture along the ohio the mississippi upon the gulf the potomac and gradually in the interior wherever defence is assured from the military power that at first overthrew the government it is now plain to every sense that nothing but the interposition of the soldiery of foreign tyrannies can prevent all the states from resuming their places in the union casting from them the demon of discord the few states remaining in arms that made the war for slavery as a sine qua non now propose to surrender it and even the independence which was coveted to support it as a price for foreign aid slavery abandoned the issue is changed and war against the union becomes a war for monarchy and the cry for independence of a government that assured the independence of the southern states of all foreign powers and their equality in the union is converted into an appeal for succor to european potentates to whom they offer in return homage as dependencies and this is the price they propose to pay for success in breaking up the national government but will the people who have consented to wage this war for an institution once considered a property now that they have abandoned it continue the war to enslave themselves would they abandon slavery to commend themselves to the protection of european monarchies and thus escape the embrace of that national republic as a part of which they have enjoyed almost a century of prosperity and renown the whole aspect of the controversy upon this view is changed the patriarchal domestic institution given up and the idea of independence and being let alone in happy isolation surrendered to obtain the boon of foreign protection under the rule of monarchy the most modern exemplification of this program for discontented republican states defeating their popular institution by intestine hostilities is found in the french emperor's austrian deputy maximilian sent to prescribe for their disorders the design of louis napoleon in reference to conquest on this continent is not left to conjecture with extraordinary frankness he made a public declaration that his object was to make the latin race supreme in the southern section of the north american continent this is a napoleonic idea the great napoleon in a letter or one of his dictations at st helena states that it had been his purpose to embody an army of negroes in san domingo to be landed in the slave states with french support to instigate the blacks there to insurrection and through revolution effect conquest louis napoleon saw revolution involving the struggle of races and sections on the question of slavery made to his hand when he instantly recurred to his uncle's ideas of establishing colonies to create commerce and a navy for france and to breed the material for armies to maintain his european empire jefferson davis is the fortunate man who now holds the commanding position to encounter this formidable scheme of conquest and whose fiat can at the same time deliver his country from the bloody agony now covering it in mourning he can drive maximilian from his american throne and baffle the designs of napoleon to subject our southern people to the latin race with a breath he can blow away all pretence for proscription conscription or confiscation in the southern states restore their fields to luxuriant cultivation their ports to the commerce of the world their constitutions and their rights under them as essentially a part of the constitution of the united states to that strong guarantee under which they flourish for nearly a century not only as equals but down to the hour of conflict the prevalent power on the continent to accomplish this great good for our common country president lincoln has opened the way in his amnesty proclamation and the message which looks to armistice 
suppose the first enlarged to embrace all engaged in the war suppose secret preliminaries to armistice enable president davis to transfer such portions of his army as he may deem proper for his purpose to texas held out to it as the land of promise suppose this force on the banks of the rio grande armed equipped and provided and juarez propitiated and rallying the liberals of mexico to give it welcome and support could it not enter mexico in full confidence of expelling the invaders who taking advantage of the distractions of our own republic have overthrown that of mexico and established a foreign despotism to rule that land and spread its power over ours i know romero the able patriotic minister who represents the republic of mexico near our government he is intimate with my son montgomery who is persuaded that he could induce juarez to devolve all the power he can command on president davis a dictatorship if necessary to restore the rights of mexico and her people and provide for the stability of its government with such hopes inspiring and a veteran army of invincibles to rally on such a force of mexicans might be embodied as would make the conquest of the country the work of its own people under able leading but if more force were wanted than these mexican recruits and the army of the south would supply would not multitudes of the army of the north officers and men be found ready to embark in an enterprise vital to the interests of our whole republic the republican party has staked itself on the assertion of the monroe doctrine proposed by canning and sanctioned by a british cabinet the democrats of the north have proclaimed their adhesion to it and i doubt not from the spirit exhibited by the congress now in session however unwilling to declare war it would countenance all legitimate efforts short of such result to restore the mexican republic he who expels the bonaparte hapsburg dynasty from our southern flank which general jackson in one of his letters warned me was the vulnerable point through which foreign invasion would come will ally his name with those of washington and jackson as a defender of the liberty of the country if in delivering mexico he should model its states in form and principle to adapt them to our union and add a new southern constellation to its benignant sky while rounding off our possession on the continent at the isthmus and opening the way to blending the waters of the atlantic and pacific thus embracing our republic in the arms of the ocean he would complete the work of jefferson who first set one foot of our colossal government on the pacific by a stride from the gulf of mexico such achievement would be more highly appreciated in the south inasmuch as it would restore the equipoise between the northern and southern states if indeed such sectional distinctions could be recognized after the peculiar institution which created them had ceased to exist it is of course possible that the hard mental processes in political metaphysics through which jefferson davis had forced his intellect in pursuing the ambitious hallucinations which led him from loyalty to treason had blighted all generous sentiment and healthy imagination but if his heart was yet capable of a single patriotic memory and impulse strange emotions must have troubled him as he sat listening to the reading of this paper by the man who had been the familiar friend the trusted adviser it might almost be said the confidential voice of andrew jackson it was as though the ghost of the great president had come from his grave in tennessee to draw him a sad and solemn picture of the ruin and shame to which he was bringing and had almost brought the american republic especially his people of the southern states nationality squandered slavery doomed and his confederacy a supplicant for life at the hands of european despotisms if he did not correctly realize the scene and hour in all its impressiveness he seems at least to have tacitly acknowledged that his sanguinary adventure in statesmanship was moribund and that it was high time to listen earnestly to any scheme which might give hope of averting from himself and his adherence the catastrophe to whose near approach he could no longer shut his eyes 
mr blair's report thus narrates the remainder of the interview i then said to him there is my problem mr davis do you think it possible to be solved after consideration he said i think so i then said you see that i make the great point of this matter that the war is no longer made for slavery but monarchy you know that if the war is kept up and the union kept divided armies must be kept afoot on both sides and this state of things has never continued long without resulting in monarchy on one side or the other and on both generally he assented to this and with great emphasis remarked that he was like lucius junius brutus and uttered the sentiment ascribed to him in shakespeare without exactly quoting it there was a brutus once that would have brooked the eternal devil to keep a state in rome as easily as a king then he said that he was thoroughly for popular government that this feeling had been born and bred in him touching the project he said of bringing the sections together again the great difficulty was the excessive vindictiveness produced by outrages perpetrated in the invaded states during the war he said reconcilement must depend he thought upon time and events which he hoped would restore better feelings but that he was certain that no circumstance would have a greater effect than to see the arms of our countrymen from the north and the south united in a war upon a foreign power assailing principles of government common to both sections and threatening their destruction and he said he was convinced that all the powers of europe felt it their interest that our people in this quarrel should exhaust all their energies in destroying each other and thus make them a prey to the potentates of europe who felt that the destruction of our government was necessary to the maintenance of the monarchical principles on which their own were founded i told him that i was encouraged by finding him holding these views and believed that our country if impressed with them as i thought it might be universally would soon resume its happy unity he said i ought to know with what reluctance he had been drawn out of the union that he laboured to the last moment to avoid it that he had followed the old flag longer and with more devotion than anything else on earth that at bull run when he saw the flag he supposed it was his own hanging on the staff they were more alike then than now and when the flag of the united states unfurled itself in the breeze he saw it with a sigh but he had to choose between it and his own and he had to look to it as that of an enemy he felt now that it was laid up but the circumstances to which he had adverted might restore it and reconcilement be easier with regard to mexico if the foreign power was driven out it would have to depend on the events there to make it possible to connect that country with this and restore the equipoise to which i looked nobody could foresee how things would shape themselves touching the matter of arrangement for reconcilement proposed by me he remarked that all depended upon well-founded confidence and looking at me with very significant expression he said what mr blair do you think of mr seward i replied mr seward is a very pleasant companion he has good social qualities but i have no doubt that where his ambition is concerned his selfish feelings prevail over all principle i have no doubt he would betray any man no matter what his obligations to him if he stood in the way of his selfish and ambitious schemes but i said this matter if entered upon at all must be with mr lincoln himself the transaction is a military transaction and depends entirely upon the commander-in-chief of our armies if he goes into it he will certainly consider it as the affair of the military head of the government now i know that mr lincoln is capable of great personal sacrifices of sacrificing the strongest feelings of his heart of sacrificing a friend when he thinks it necessary for the good of the country and you may rely upon it if he plights his faith to any man in a transaction for which he is responsible as an officer or a man he will maintain his word in inviolably mr davis said he was glad to hear me say so he did not know mr lincoln but he was sure i did and therefore my declaration gave him the highest satisfaction as to mr seward he had no confidence in him himself and he did not know any man or party in the south that had any
in relation to the mode of effecting the object about which we have been talking he said we ought soon to have some understanding because things to be done or omitted will depend upon it that he was willing to appoint persons to have conferences without regard to forms that there must be some medium of communication that he would appoint a person or persons who could be implicitly relied on by mr lincoln that he had on a former occasion indicated judge campbell of the supreme court as a person who could be relied on i told him he was a person in whom i had unbounded confidence both as regarded talents and fidelity in reply to some remarks that i made as to the fame he would acquire in relieving the country from all its disasters restoring its harmony and extending its dominion to the isthmus he said what his name might be in history he cared not if he could restore the prosperity and happiness of his country that was the end and aim of his being for himself death would end his cares and that was very easy to be accomplished the next day after my first interview he sent me a note saying he thought i might desire to have something in writing in regard to his conclusion and therefore he made a brief statement which i brought away the substantial accuracy of mr blair's report is confirmed by the memorandum of the same interview which jefferson davis wrote at the time and has since printed in this conversation the rebel leader took little pains to disguise his entire willingness to enter upon the wild scheme of military conquest and annexation which could easily be read between the lines of a political crusade to rescue the monroe doctrine from its present peril if mr blair felt elated at having so quickly made a convert of the confederate president he was still further gratified at discovering yet more favorable symptoms in his official surrounding at richmond in the three or four days he spent at the rebel capital he found nearly every prominent personage convinced of the hopeless condition of the rebellion and even eager to seize upon any contrivance to help them out of their direful prospects the letter which he bore from jefferson davis to be shown to president lincoln was in the following language richmond virginia twelve january sixty five f p blair esq sir i have deemed it proper and probably desirable to you to give you in this form the substance of remarks made by me to be repeated by you to president lincoln etc etc i have no disposition to find obstacles in forms and am willing now as heretofore to enter into negotiations for the restoration of peace and am ready to send a commission whenever i have reason to suppose it will be received or to receive a commission if the united states government shall choose to send one that notwithstanding the rejection of our former offers i would if you could promise that a commissioner minister or other agent would be received appoint one immediately and renew the effort to enter into conference with a view to secure peace to the two countries yours etc jefferson davis but the government councils at washington were not ruled by the spirit of political adventure abraham lincoln had a loftier conception of patriotic duty and a higher ideal of national ethics the proposal to divert his nation conceived in liberty from its grand task of preserving for humanity government of the people by the people for the people and degrade its heroic struggle and sacrifice to the low level of a joint filibustering foray which instead of crowning his work of emancipation might perhaps eventuate in a renewal extension and perpetuation of slavery did not receive from him an instant's consideration his whole interest in mr blair's mission was in the despondency of the rebel leaders which it disclosed and the possibility of bringing them to an acknowledgment of their despair and the abandonment of their resistance his only response to the overture thus half officially brought to his notice was to open the door of negotiation a little wider than he had done before but for the specific and exclusive objects of union and peace as an answer to jefferson davis's note he therefore wrote mr blair the following washington january eighteen eighteen sixty five f p blair esq sir you having shown me mr davis's letter to you of the twelfth instant you may say to him that i have constantly been am now and shall continue ready to receive any agent whom he or any other influential person now 
resisting the national authority may informally send to me with the view of securing peace to the people of our one common country yours etc a lincoln with this note mr blair returned to richmond giving mr davis such feeble excuses as he could hastily frame why the president had rejected his overture for a joint invasion of mexico alleging that mr lincoln was embarrassed by radical politicians and could not use political agencies mr blair then but again without authority proposed a new project namely that grant and lee should enter into negotiations the scope and object of which however he seems to have left altogether vague the simple truth is evident that mr blair was as best he might covering his retreat from an abortive intrigue he soon reported to davis that military negotiation was out of the question jefferson davis therefore had only two alternatives before him either to repeat his stubborn ultimatum of separation and independence or frankly to accept lincoln's ultimatum of reunion the principal richmond authorities knew and some of them had tacitly admitted that their confederacy was nearly in collapse vice president stevens in a secret session of the rebel senate had pointed out that we could not match our opponents in numbers and should not attempt to cope with them in direct physical power and advocated a fabian policy which involved the abandonment of richmond judge campbell rebel assistant secretary of war had collected facts and figures which a few weeks later he embodied in a formal report showing the south to be in practical exhaustion lee sent a dispatch saying he had not two days rations for his army richmond was already in a panic at rumors of evacuation flour was selling at a thousand dollars a barrel in confederate currency the recent fall of fort fisher had closed the last avenue through which blockade runners could bring them foreign supplies governor brown of georgia was refusing to obey orders from richmond and characterizing them as usurping and despotic under such circumstances a defiant cry of independence would not reassure anybody nor on the other hand was it longer possible to remain silent mr blair's first visit to richmond had created general interest old friends plied him with eager questions and laid his truthful answers concerning their gloomy prospects solemnly to heart the fact of his secret consultation with davis transpired when mr blair came a second time and held a second secret consultation with the rebel president wonder and rumor rose to fever heat impelled to take action mr davis had not the courage to be frank he called first vice president stevens and afterwards his cabinet to a discussion of the project a peace commission of three was appointed consisting of alexander h stevens vice president r m t hunter senator and ex-secretary of state and john a campbell assistant secretary of war all of them convinced that the rebellion was hopeless and yet unwilling to admit the logical consequences and necessities the drafting of instructions for the guidance of the commissioners was a difficult problem since the explicit condition prescribed by mr lincoln's note was that he would only receive an agent sent him with the view of securing peace to the people of our one common country the astute mr benjamin rebel secretary of state in order to make the instructions as vague and general as possible proposed a simple direction to confer upon the subject to which it relates his action and language were broad enough to carry the inference that in his secret heart he too was sick of rebellion and ready to make terms whether it was so meant or not his chief refused to receive the delicate suggestion with the ruin and defeat of the confederate cause staring him full in the face davis could bring himself neither to a dignified refusal nor to a resigned acceptance of the form of negotiation as mr lincoln had tendered it even in the gulf of war and destitution in which he had led his people he could not forego the vanity of masquerading as a champion he was unwilling says mr benjamin to appear to betray his trust as confederate president you thought from regard to your personal honor that your language ought to be such as to render impossible any malignant comment on your actions but if so why not adopt the heroic alternative and refuse to negotiate why resort to the yet more humiliating absurdity of sending a commission on terms which he knew mr lincoln had pointedly rejected instead of mr benjamin's phraseology jefferson davis wrote the following instruction to the commissioners which carried a palpable contradiction on its face 
richmond january twenty eighth eighteen sixty five in conformity with the letter of mr lincoln of which the foregoing is a copy you are requested to proceed to washington city for informal conference with him upon the issues involved in the existing war and for the purpose of securing peace to the two countries your obedient servant jefferson davis end of chapter five chapter six of abraham lincoln a history volume ten this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume ten by john hay and john george nicolay chapter six the hampton roads conference with this double meaning credential the commissioners presented themselves at the union lines near richmond on the evening of january twenty ninth eighteen sixty five and instead of frankly showing their authority asked admission in accordance with an understanding claimed to exist with lieutenant-general grant on their way to washington as peace commissioners the application being telegraphed to washington mr stanton answered that no one should be admitted under such character or profession until the president's instructions were received mr lincoln being apprised of the application promptly dispatched major thomas t eckert an officer of the war department with written directions to admit the commissioners under safe conduct if they would say in writing that they came for the purpose of an informal conference on the basis of his note of january eighteen to mr blair with the view of securing peace to the people of our one common country before this officer arrived however the commissioners reconsidered the form of their application and addressed a new one to general grant asking permission to proceed to washington to hold a conference with president lincoln upon the subject of the existing war and with the view of ascertaining upon what terms it may be terminated in pursuance of the course indicated by him in his letter to mr blair of january eighteen eighteen sixty five pursuant to this request they were provisionally conveyed to grant's headquarters one of them records with evident surprise the unostentatious surroundings of the general-in-chief i was instantly struck with the great simplicity and perfect naturalness of his manners and the entire absence of everything like affectation show or even the usual military air or mien of men in his position he was plainly attired sitting in a log cabin busily writing on a small table by a kerosene lamp it was night when we arrived there was nothing in his appearance or surrounding which indicated his official rank there were neither guards nor aides about him he furnished us with comfortable quarters on board one of his dispatch boats the more i became acquainted with him the more i became thoroughly impressed with the very extraordinary combination of rare elements of character which he exhibited during the time he met us frequently and conversed freely upon various subjects not much upon our mission i saw however very clearly that he was very anxious for the proposed conference to take place the commissioner's note to grant had been a substantial compliance with the requirement of president lincoln and so accepting it the latter on the thirty first of january sent secretary seward to meet them giving him for this purpose the following written instructions executive mansion washington january thirty one eighteen sixty five honorable william h seward secretary of state you will proceed to fortress monroe virginia there to meet and informally confer with messrs stevens hunter and campbell on the basis of my letter to f p blair esq of january eighteen eighteen sixty five a copy of which you have you will make known to them that three things are indispensable to wit first the restoration of the national authority throughout all the states second no receding by the executive of the united states on the slavery question from the position assumed thereon in the late annual message to congress and in preceding documents third no cessation of hostilities short of an end of the war and the disbanding of all forces hostile to the government you will inform them that all propositions of theirs not inconsistent with the above will be considered and passed upon in a spirit of sincere liberality you will hear all they may choose to say and report it to me you will not assume to definitely consummate anything yours etc abraham lincoln mr seward started on the morning of february one and simultaneously with his departure the president repeated to general grant 
the monition which the secretary of war had already sent him two days before through major eckhart let nothing which is transpiring change hinder or delay your military movements or plans grant responded to the order promising that no armistice should ensue adding the troops are kept in readiness to move at the shortest notice if occasion should justify it major eckert arrived while mr seward was yet on his way on informing the commissioners of the president's exact requirement they replied by presenting jefferson davis's instruction this was receding from the terms contained in their note to grant and major eckert promptly notified them that they could not proceed further unless they complied strictly with president lincoln's terms thus at half past nine on the night of february one the mission of stevens hunter and campbell was practically at an end it was never explained why they took this course for the next day they again changed their minds the only conjecture which seems plausible is that they hoped to persuade general grant to take some extraordinary and dictatorial step one of them hints as much in a newspaper article written long after the war we had tried he wrote to intimate to general grant before we reached old point that a settlement generally satisfactory to both sides could be more easily effected through him and general lee by an armistice than in any other way the attempt was in vain the general had indeed listened to them with great interest and in their eagerness to convert him they had probably indulged in stronger phrases of repentance than they felt about an hour after the commissioners refused major eckert's ultimatum general grant telegraphed the following to secretary stanton from which it will be seen that at least two of the commissioners had declared to him their personal willingness to restore peace and union february one ten thirty p m eighteen sixty five hon edwin m stanton secretary of war now that the interview between major eckert under his written instructions and mr stevens and party has ended i will state confidentially but not officially to become a matter of record that i am convinced upon conversation with messrs stevens and hunter that their intentions are good and their desire sincere to restore peace and union i have not felt myself at liberty to express even views of my own or to account for my reticency this has placed me in an awkward position which i could have avoided by not seeing them in the first instance i fear now their going back without any expression from any one in authority will have a bad influence at the same time i recognize the difficulties in the way of receiving these informal commissioners at this time and do not know what to recommend i am sorry however that mr lincoln cannot have an interview with the two named in this dispatch if not all three now within our lines their letter to me was all that the president's instructions contemplated to secure their safe conduct if they had used the same language to major eckert u s grant lieutenant-general on the morning of february two president lincoln went to the war department and reading major eckert's report was about to recall mr seward by telegraph when grant's dispatch was placed in his hands the communication served to change his purpose resolving not to neglect the indications of sincerity here described he immediately telegraphed in reply say to the gentlemen i will meet them personally at fortress monroe as soon as i can get there the commissioners by this time had decided to accept mr lincoln's terms which they did in writing to both major eckert and general grant and therefore were at once conveyed from general grant's headquarters at city point to fort monroe where mr lincoln joined secretary seward on the same night on the morning of february three eighteen sixty five the rebel commissioners were conducted on board the river queen lying at anchor near fort monroe where president lincoln and secretary seward awaited them and in the saloon of that steamer an informal conference of four hours duration ensued it was agreed beforehand that no writing or memorandum should be made at the time so that the record of the interview remains only in the separate accounts which each of the rebel commissioners afterwards wrote out from memory neither mr seward nor president lincoln ever having made any report in detail former personal acquaintance made the beginning easy and cordial through pleasant reminiscences of the past and mutual inquiries after friends in a careful analysis of these reports thus furnished by the confederates themselves the first striking feature is the difference of intention between the parties it is apparent that mr lincoln went honestly and frankly in all friendliness to offer them the best terms he could to secure peace and reunion but to abate no jot of official duty and personal dignity 
while the main thought of the commissioners was to evade the express condition on which they had been admitted to conference to seek to postpone the vital issue and to propose an armistice by debating a mere juggling expedient against which they had in a private agreement with one another already committed themselves mr stevens began the discussion by asking whether there was no way of restoring the harmony and happiness of former days to which mr lincoln replied there was but one way that he knew of and that was for those who were resisting the laws of the union to cease that resistance mr stevens rejoined that they had been induced to believe that both parties might for a while leave their present strife in abeyance and occupy themselves with some continental question till their anger should cool and accommodation become possible here mr lincoln interposed promptly and frankly i suppose you refer to something that mr blair has said now it is proper to state at the beginning that whatever he said was of his own accord and without the least authority from me when he applied for a passport to go to richmond with certain ideas which he wished to make known to me i told him flatly that i did not want to hear them if he desired to go to richmond of his own accord i would give him a passport but he had no authority to speak for me in any way whatever when he returned and brought me mr davis's letter i gave him the one to which you alluded in your application for leave to cross the lines i was always willing to hear propositions for peace on the conditions of this letter and on no other the restoration of the union is a sine qua non with me and hence my instructions that no conference was to be held except upon that basis despite this express disavowal mr stevens persisted in believing that mr lincoln had come with ulterior designs and went on at considerable length to elaborate his idea of a joint mexican expedition to be undertaken during an armistice and without a prior pledge of ultimate reunion such an expedition he argued would establish the right of self-government to all peoples on this continent against the dominion or control of any european power establishing this principle of the right of peoples to self-government would necessarily also establish by logical sequence the right of states to self-government and present passions being cooled there would ensue an ocean-bound federal republic under the operation of this continental regulator the ultimate absolute sovereignty of each state his idea was that all the states might reasonably be expected very soon to return of their own accord to their former relations to the union just as they came together at first by their own consent and for their mutual interests others too would continue to join it in the future as they had in the past this great law of the system would effect the same certain results in its organization as the law of gravitation in the material world mr stevens does not seem to have realized how comically absurd was his effort to convert president lincoln to the doctrine of secession by this very transparent bit of cunning and the others listened with considerate and patient gravity mr seward at length punctured the bubble with a few well-directed sentences when mr hunter also intervened to express his entire dissent from mr stevens's proposal in this view reports mr stevens naively he expressed the joint opinion of the commissioners indeed we had determined not to enter into any agreement that would require the confederate arms to join in any invasion of mexico but the rebel vice-president fails to record why under these circumstances he had opened this useless branch of the discussion at this stage president lincoln brought back the conversation pointedly to the original object of the conference he repeated that he could not entertain a proposition for an armistice on any terms while the great and vital question of reunion was undisposed of that was the first question to be settled he could enter into no treaty convention or stipulation or agreement with the confederate states jointly or separately upon that or any other subject but upon the basis first settled that the union was to be restored any such agreement or stipulation would be a quasi recognition of the states then in arms against the national government as a separate power that he never could do this branch of the discussion also reports judge campbell was closed by mr lincoln who answered that it could not be entertained that there could be no war without the consent of congress and no treaty without the consent of the senate of the united states that he could make no treaty with the confederate states because that would be a recognition of those states and that this could not be done under any circumstances that unless a settlement were made there would be danger that the quarrel would break out in the midst of the joint operations that one party might unite with the common enemy to destroy the other 
that he was determined to do nothing to suspend the operations for bringing the existing struggle to a close to attain any collateral end mr lincoln in this part of the conversation admitted that he had power to make a military convention and that his arrangements under that might extend to settle several of the points mentioned but others it could not the theory of secession as a conservative principle and the bait of a joint expedition to steal mexico under guise of enforcing the monroe doctrine being thus cleared away the discussion turned to the only reasonable inquiry which remained judge campbell asked how restoration could be effected if the confederate states would consent mentioning important questions such as the disbandment of the army confiscation acts on both sides the effect of the emancipation proclamation representation in congress the division of virginia and so on which would inevitably arise and require immediate adjustment on these various topics much conversation ensued which even as briefly reported is too long to be quoted entire it will be more useful to condense under specific headings the substantial declarations and offers which the commissioners report mr lincoln to have made one reconstruction the shortest way the insurgents could effect this he said was by disbanding their armies and permitting the national authorities to resume their functions mr seward called attention to that phrase of his annual message where he had declared in stating a single condition of peace i mean simply to say that the war will cease on the part of the government whenever it shall have ceased on the part of those who began it as to the rebel states being admitted to representation in congress mr lincoln very promptly replied that his own individual opinion was they ought to be he also thought they would be but he could not enter into any stipulation upon the subject his own opinion was that when the resistance ceased and the national authority was recognized the states would be immediately restored to their practical relations to the union two confiscation acts mr lincoln said that so far as the confiscation acts and other penal acts were concerned their enforcement was left entirely with him and on that point he was perfectly willing to be full and explicit and on his assurance perfect reliance might be placed he should exercise the power of the executive with the utmost liberality as to all questions says judge campbell's report involving rights of property the courts could determine them and that congress would no doubt be liberal in making restitution of confiscated property or by indemnity after the passions that had been excited by the war had been composed three the emancipation proclamation mr lincoln said that was a judicial question how the courts would decide it he did not know and could give no answer his own opinion was that as the proclamation was a war measure and would have effect only from its being an exercise of the war power as soon as the war ceased it would be inoperative for the future it would be held to apply only to such slaves as had come under its operation while it was in active exercise this was his individual opinion but the courts might decide the other way and hold that it effectually emancipated all the slaves in the states to which it applied at the time so far as he was concerned he should leave it to the courts to decide he never would change or modify the terms of the proclamation in the slightest particular at another point in the conversation he said it was not his intention in the beginning to interfere with slavery in the states that he never would have done it if he had not been compelled by necessity to do it to maintain the union that the subject presented many difficult and perplexing questions to him that he had hesitated for some time and had resorted to this measure only when driven to it by public necessity that he had been in favor of the general government prohibiting the extension of slavery into the territories but did not think that the government possessed power over the subject in the states except as a war measure and that he had always himself been in favor of emancipation but not immediate emancipation even by the states many evils attending this appeared to him recurring once more to the subject of emancipation he went on to say that he would be willing to be taxed to remunerate the southern people for their slaves he believed the people of the north were as responsible for slavery as the people of the south and if the war should then cease with the voluntary abolition of slavery by the states he should be in favor individually of the government paying a fair indemnity for the loss to the owners he said he believed this feeling had an extensive existence at the north he knew some who were in favor of an appropriation as high as four hundred millions of dollars for this purpose i could mention persons said he whose names would astonish you who are willing to do this if the war shall now cease without further expense and with the abolition of slavery as stated but on this subject he said he could give no assurance enter into no stipulation he barely expressed his own feelings and views and what he believed to be the views of others upon the subject 
for the division of virginia mr lincoln said he could only give an individual opinion which was that western virginia would continue to be recognized as a separate state in the union five the thirteenth amendment mr seward brought to the notice of the commissioners one topic which to them was new namely that only a few days before on the thirty first of january congress had passed the thirteenth amendment to the constitution which when ratified by three-fourths of the states would effect an immediate abolition of slavery throughout the entire union the reports of the commissioners represent mr seward as saying that if the south would submit and agree to immediate restoration the restored states might yet defeat the ratification of this amendment intimating that congress had passed it under the predominance of revolutionary passion which would abate on the termination of the war it may well be doubted whether mr seward stated the case as strongly as the commissioners intimate since he himself like mr lincoln and his entire cabinet had favored the measure it is probable that the commissioners allowed their own feelings and wishes to color too strongly the hypothesis he stated and to interpret as a probability what he mentioned as only among the possible events of the future it will be seen that in what he said upon these various propositions mr lincoln was always extremely careful to discriminate between what he was authorized under the constitution to do as executive and what would devolve upon coordinate branches of the government under their own powers and limitations with the utmost circumspection he pointed out the distinctions between his personal opinions and wishes and his official authority more especially however did he repeat and emphasize the declaration that he would do none of the things mentioned or promised without a previous pledge of reunion and cessation of resistance even in case the confederate states should entertain the proposition of a return to the union says mr stephens's narrative he persisted in asserting that he could not enter into any agreement upon this subject reconstruction or upon any other matters of that sort with parties in arms against the government mr hunter interposed and in illustration of the propriety of the executive entering into agreements with persons in arms against the acknowledged rightful public authority referred to repeated instances of this character between charles i of england and the people in arms against him mr lincoln in reply to this said i do not profess to be posted in history on all such matters i will turn you over to seward all i distinctly recollect about the case of charles i is that he lost his head the pertinent retort reduced mr hunter to his last rhetorical resource a complaint that the confederate states and their people were by these terms forced to unconditional surrender and submission to this mr seward replied with patience and dignity that no words like unconditional submission had been used or any importing or justly implying degradation or humiliation even to the people of the confederate states nor did he think that in yielding to the execution of the laws under the constitution of the united states with all its guarantees and securities for personal and political rights as they might be declared to be by the courts could be properly considered as unconditional submission to conquerors or as having anything humiliating in it the southern people and the southern states would be under the constitution of the united states with all their rights secured thereby in the same way and through the same instrumentalities as the similar rights of the people of the other states were the reader will recall that in his last annual message president lincoln declared his belief based on careful consideration of all the evidence accessible that it was useless to attempt to negotiate with jefferson davis but that the prospect would be better with his followers mr lincoln had evidently gone to fort monroe in hope of making some direct impression upon stevens and hunter whom grant represented as having such good intentions to restore peace and union seizing the proper opportunity he pressed upon stevens the suggestion of separate state action to bring about a discontinuance of hostilities addressing him he said if i resided in georgia with my present sentiments i'll tell you what i would do if i were in your place i would go home and get the governor of the state to call the legislature together and get them to recall all the state troops from the war elect senators and members to congress and ratify this constitutional amendment prospectively so as to take effect say in five years such a ratification would be valid in my opinion i have looked into the subject and think such a prospective ratification would be valid whatever may have been the views of your people before the war they must be convinced now that slavery is doomed it cannot last long in any event and the best course it seems to me for your public men to pursue would be to adopt such a policy as will avoid as far as possible the evils of immediate emancipation this would be my course if i were in your place 
the salutary advice was wasted mr stevens was a very incarnation of political paradoxes perhaps in all the south there was not another man whose personal desires were so moderate and correct and whose political theories were so radical and wrong at the beginning he had opposed secession as premature and foolish war as desperate and ruinous yet against his better judgment he had followed his cornerstone theory of slavery and his supremacy theory of states rights to the war and the ruin he foretold now at the end of four years experiment he still clung obstinately to his new theory of secession as a continental regulator and the vain hope that mr lincoln would yet adopt it when at last the parties were separating with friendly handshakings he asked mr lincoln to reconsider the plan of an armistice on the basis of a mexican expedition well stevens replied mr lincoln i will reconsider it but i do not think my mind will change and so ended the hampton roads conference the commissioners returned to richmond in great disappointment and communicated the failure of their efforts to jefferson davis whose chagrin was as great as their own they had all caught eagerly at the hope that this negotiation would somehow extricate them from the dilemmas and dangers whose crushing portent they realized but had no power to avert except by surrender and now when this last hope failed them they were doubly cast down campbell says he favored negotiations for peace doubtless meaning by this language that he advocated the acceptance of the proffered terms stevens yet believed that mr lincoln would be tempted by the mexican scheme and would reconsider his decision he therefore advised that the results of the meeting should be kept secret and when the other commissioners and davis refused to follow this advice he gave up the confederate cause as hopeless withdrew from richmond abandoned the rebellion and went into retirement his signature to the brief public report of the commissioners stating the result of the hampton roads conference was his last participation in the ill-starred enterprise davis took the only course open to him after refusing the honorable peace which mr lincoln had tendered he transmitted the commissioners report to the rebel congress with a brief and dry message stating that the enemy refused any terms except those the conqueror may grant and then arranged as vigorous an effort as the circumstances permitted once more to fire the southern heart a public meeting was called and on the evening of february sixth jefferson davis and others made speeches at the african church which judging from the meagre reports that were printed were as denunciatory and bellicose as the bitterest confederate could have wished davis particularly is represented to have excelled himself in defiant heroic sooner than we should ever be united again he said he would be willing to yield up everything he had on earth if it were possible he would sacrifice a thousand lives and further announced his confidence that they would yet compel the yankees in less than twelve months to petition us for peace on our own terms he denounced president lincoln as his majesty abraham the first and said before the campaign was over he and seward might find they had been speaking to their masters this extravagant rhetoric would seem merely grotesque were it not embittered by the reflection that it was the signal which carried many additional thousands of brave soldiers to bloody graves in continuing a palpably hopeless military struggle End of chapter six